Mike Westenbert is someone who describes himself as an edutainer. He's been uh, working as a management consultant with very large global management consulting firms for, I think he told me, 36 years. Um, and uh, I've known him for about 30 of those. Uh, when I first met Mike, he was solving the year 2000 problem. And um, he did a damn good job there, because as you know, there wasn't a 2000 problem. <laughs> uh, but more importantly, he spent a lot of his life doing training and coaching with him. And um, tonight he is uh, talking to us as a private individual. I should not attribute anything he says to his employers. And uh, indeed, I'm not going to tell you who they are. And I was going to do just a quick sort of wave so that you believe that I'm actually a human being and not actually a Gen AI. Well, I was saying earlier to Simon, we're looking at one of the text-to-video companies where you can actually go to one of those green screen studios in London with like 50 cameras and they can make an avatar of you. If you've been down to Elizabeth Park to see the ABBA concert, imagine that. They can also clone your voice on here. So... Next year, I won't actually be here. I'll be on the beach in the Bahamas. And what you'll see is my AI-generated avatar. But for today, I am a real human being. Um, I will kill the video. I've not got great broadband. I'm actually living down near Bath. Unfortunately, not in Bath. I am three lottery wins from actually living in the centre of Bath. So I live about um, 15 miles on the outskirts. But what I wanted to cover today was one of my sort of favorite topics around innovation, creativity, and brainstorming. Because if there's one thing that we still need, even in this mad world of Gen AI and ChatGPT, is original creative thoughts. So I thought for the next hour, it'd be great to understand, well, what do we actually mean by brainstorming? and some of the different ways that we can do that. And I'll share in particular some ways you can do brainstorming in a virtual environment. So apologies to those real humans sat in the room. Um, you can certainly take part in this, but I'm particularly focusing on those that are online. I think it's about 30, 35 of you. I'll share some of my top tips. I don't pretend they're the only tips that are out there. But after sort of 36,000 years of doing this, I started my career working on the pyramid projects with the Egyptians. I then moved to Rome to help build the main parts of Rome. And then I then, when the Romans invaded Britain, that's when I first came and started working here. What I can't do, though, in an hour is turn you into a global expert. I've done it for 35 years, and I still don't think I'm an expert because the joy is there's always more things that you can learn. So, well, let's get the juices going immediately. And in the chat and those in the main room, just have a think, maybe chat amongst yourselves. What does brainstorming mean to you? So let me go quiet for 30 seconds and let you think and type. We want to bridge um, some, some groups here. We get a little bit closer. We've got 30 seconds. <laughs> Maybe for the next one, we have a good opportunity. An example of brainstorming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, want, we want to see what That's you're seeing out there in uh, online world, in the chat. Find the chat. Send us your thoughts. Well, Desmond's first up. Well done, Desmond. Yes, yes. People in the room can read the chat as it comes up, yeah, like a ticker tape. Ah, some fabulous ideas coming through. You're sharing, generating ideas, collaborating amongst ourselves. Like Considering out-of-the-box thinking, yep. Thinking That's sideways, to upside. Has anything to say? Well, some thoughts in the room? Formal process, isn't it? You um, generate ideas without judgment and then uh, write them all down and then later on you go, go back, reconvene and con consider them and evaluate them, say whether they're good or not. Or I, like, they're I like, I like, I like, I uh, like. Can you can you put it back to the chat, uh, Simon? At least uh, generating ideas without judgment and yeah, then... Without structure. 
and without the structure. Yeah, uh, well, they, yeah, they can hear you. Um, it, but can you can you put in the chat or something like that? Yeah, can they hear us? I can hear you. All right. Okay. So if they're hearing all your ideas. So, some lovely ideas there, and it looks as though someone's had a sneaky peek at my slides from a bit later. So extra house points to Ravenclaw there for that. There's certainly something around being together, bouncing ideas off each other, some structure, but perhaps not too much, because you don't want to inhibit people in what they're trying to achieve. Alex F. Osborne was one of the sort of historians, and lovely quote from him around creativity being a delicate flower. And certainly something that I often see is if you're not careful, it's so easy to say, oh, that won't work, that's no good, that's useless, and kill ideas at birth. And I'll see a bit later a technique I call greenhousing, which is a way that you can flip things to make sure that you can help develop people's embryonic, immature, new ideas, rather than kill them at birth. A quick definition, which very much sums up what we saw both in the chat and what you were talking about in the main room. Group discussion to produce ideas or solve problems. Often I find it's at the same time. Why are we brainstorming? Because there's a challenge, an issue, a concern that we're trying to find some answers for. Next question to both those in the room and in the chat. Why are icebreakers and energizers so important for kicking off brainstorming. So again, let me go quiet for 30 seconds and let you type away in the chat and have a discussion in the main room as well. Good. That's okay. That's better. Thank you. There are some intriguing answers coming through, helping people to focus, making them relax, psychological safety. I love that. Any, anyone want, in the room wants to shout out some ideas as well, please do. Go ahead. Well, I've always found that internal reflection was more productive to creativity in my case. So I've broken a rule already. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant, brilliant. I think that could be a good uh, icebreaker, right? Uh, yeah. Man getting into contradiction. Someone's put, it encourages people to talk. Anyone and else want, from the room? Anybody else in the room? It's great for to generate more ideas here. <laughs> yeah, and people who are online, you're, you're welcome to talk to us as well at the uh, appropriate moment. You know, if you want to shout out something, please do. I'm getting something around helping people feel more comfortable with each other. That's very true. Coming inhibitions. Yeah, definitely. Some lovely answers there. Now, here is my favourite icebreaker. This is the world's quickest icebreaker. Just go up to somebody and say... Excuse me, Simon, do you know how much a polar bear weighs? Count to three in your mind, enough to break the ice, and then away you go. There's some great websites out there with loads of icebreakers. As we'll see a bit later, one of the important bits is to create humour. And Simon very kindly introduced me as an edutainer. edutainer. It's a phrase I've stolen from John Cleese. So I'm the actor, comedian, and he's done some fantastic research and written some lovely little books around creativity, innovation, brainstorming. And what humour can do is it can help get the brain working in different ways. And edutainer comes from a mix of education 
and entertainment. So I try and mix a little bit of entertainment when I'm teaching, when I'm coaching, because it just helps to relax people. When you laugh, and here's the science bit, when you laugh, your brain temperature lowers slightly. And that helps with the synaptic connections. And that's very important when we're trying to do brainstorming, whether it's in a group or on our own. So here's a quick poll to see if your brain has woken up. And Simon, can people see in the room this picture quite easily? Yes. Yep. Easily, easily, sir. Thanks. So the question is, how many faces, how many ladies' faces can you see? Four, six, seven, nine, eleven, or is it making your brain hurt? So if you're on the in the chat online, just pop your answer into the chat, and then those in the room can just shout out how many they think they can see. Seven. seven. I don't see the nine. I don't see nine. The you can see nine? No, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe nine after the um, festival imbibement of alcohol a bit later, Simon. Yes, seven is what I can So I can, some people are saying seven, there's a few nines. Most people are going for seven. In which case, yes, give yourselves a, a mental pat on the back or a physical pat if you've got a colleague next door to you in the main room. People have said F. F, yep, in which case I think um, it was F, F, no, I'm, I'm C was, was the answer, seven. My next sort of challenge or question to you is why do you think it's so important to carefully define up front what I call the, the problem statement, the exam question, you know, the challenge you're trying to do the brainstorm about? Why is it so important to get that well crafted? The discussion okay, me... go in various directions. Yeah, we're saying in the room. The discussions can go in various directions. If not, if if we are not sort of we are not able to define a problem statement yep. accurately or appropriately. You can derail. Yeah. Any any additional comments in the room? With bias. Bias. Remove bias. Yep, I like that. We've got the managing scope. Nigel Cairns, if not, you won't get the ideas that you, know, you get the ideas that solve the wrong problem. Love that, Nigel. Yes, Simon saying solutions won't be sufficiently relevant or applicable to keep focus. Barbara, hello, Barbara. Diverse thinking. You need to know what you're doing it about. Nigel's back in with the the root problem and brainstorm. Get to the root cause. I've done a lot of work with some of the big innovation companies, and they will spend a lot of time crafting that challenge exam question. I've also done 35 years of project management. Many of you on the call or in the room probably have as well. And you'll know how important it is to properly scope the project. So if you see a brainstorm of a challenge, a bit like a mini project, getting that scope, getting that exam question sorted is so important. What is a problem statement? Well, for me, you know, some kind of clear description of the problem we're trying to solve. There's this lovely quote, I don't know if it's true or not, from Albert Einstein. When given the one hour challenge to save the planet from an impending disaster, he said, I would spend 55 minutes defining the problem and then I'd fix it. The rest of us might go into panic mode and just try and start to fix the problem of the impending catastrophe. So if there's one key takeaway from today is do spend the time crafting the exam question, the challenge statement, because it will pay dividends when you then start to do your brainstorming. Interesting, Nigel says, it's how many military approaches these problems Yep, no, and I've met a lot of military in my career in consultancy, and they would definitely concur with that. So here's a few examples, maybe of a, a typical brainstorming statement, and then maybe a slightly better wording of one. You know, let's discuss potential features of product A. Instead, maybe what are the most important features customers want in product A? Just helps define more clearly what we're trying to tackle. Let's brainstorm ideas to grow sales. It could take you anywhere. 
But what's the most effective actions to increase sales by a certain amount over a certain time period? It doesn't mean you can't always come back and have another challenge statement if the first one isn't working for you. But taking that time, I promise you, will pay dividends later on. I think somebody in the, in the main room may mention about you know, a process for brainstorming. If you do your research, look at it on the interweb, there's a number of different styles of processes. Here's a classic one that I've used in the past, setting a time limit. If you look at some of the work that John Cleese has done, he looks at sort of two types of time, two sets of time. The first set of time is actually just time to clear your mind. One of the problems can be is that we rush into a room and I saw a number of you rushing in at sort of 6.34 into the session today, similarly coming online at 6.36, no doubt rushing from some previous meeting you were on. You can't just suddenly then go into brainstorming mode. And John Cleese talks about you need time to clear your brain of, have I sent that email? Have I paid that bill? Did I put the dog out this morning? All that sort of noise. You need to clear, a bit like clearing your palate if you're having a 10-course taster meal. Otherwise, you just won't get much value out of your brainstorm. And then the other time to consider is how long the brainstorm will be. And classically, maybe 60 to 90 minutes. If it's only half an hour, well, we all know we've been on half-hour calls. By the time you start a few minutes late, nothing gets done. Above 60, 90 minutes, you do need a break, maybe 20, 30 minutes, not only for your brain to recover, but also about just to go for a walk, take some fluid. Importantly, look to infinity and let your eyes reaccommodate so you don't get headaches, especially if you're brainstorming, as I am right now, in a virtual environment. So the timings are important both to clear your mind and for the length of the brainstorm. Start with your target, refrain from judgment, somebody mentioned, I think, in the main room. Encourage weird and wacky ideas. And I'll tell you one of my favorite stories a bit later. Initially aiming for just quantity. And also building off other people's ideas. Because invariably some of the best ideas are where two or three people have come together and bounced off each other. If you can, staying visual helps. I know some people are more visual, some are more auditory. And you can see a, a classic room here, big whiteboard, post-it notes. I've also had creativity boxes where I've had things like silly hats, slinkies, Play-Doh, Rubik's Cubes, magic wands, hand puppets. Again, just different ways to get your brain to be more playful and having fun in what you're doing. The difficult one is the allowing one conversation at a time. And one of my favorite tricks is the three by three rule, three by three. Don't talk again for either until three other people have had a chance to say something, or maybe three minutes have elapsed. Because we all know groups where you've got loud mouths like me that can dominate and you've got the quiet ones like Simon, the reflectors, who don't get a chance. So a three-by-three three rule is quite a nice way to make sure everybody gets equal opportunity. So here's one of my first little tips or tricks for you, an online brainstorming technique, the um, idea waterfall, um, we call this. And what I'm looking to get you um, to do here is I'd like you to think of either your favorite ice cream, and unfortunately for those in the room, this doesn't quite work for you, but think of your favorite ice cream or one that you wish Hagen dazs or Ben & Jerry's would invent for you. Now, here's the kicker. We're going to do what's called a chat pod storm, a chat pod storm. I'd like you to put your answer in the chat, but don't, do not hit enter until I say three, two, one, go. And then we'll see all the answers coming up, bang, 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 rather like a snowstorm. And this is a great technique to make sure that everybody gets an equal opportunity to input 
to the brainstorm. So I'm going to go quiet for 20 seconds, let you type in your favorite ice cream or the one you'd like to have, and don't hit enter until I say go. Start thinking, start typing now. Okay, three, two, one, hit enter now, please. And you can see rather like a, a waterfall, a whole set of answers are coming up. We get, and then, we get everybody in the room to shout out their answers. Yep. Uh, three, two, one. Chocolate. <laughs> We've got chocolate, coconut, caramel magnums, cherry and almond. So if you've never used the chat pod storm in an online meeting, highly recommend it. It's something a bit different, and it also gives everybody equal opportunity. There's always somebody who's the, the first to type when it's time for the chat pod and others who are a bit slower. There's a big link here to design thinking. Um, as well. And if you've not seen design thinking, which goes through an empathy stage where you're doing that exam question, then a definition, the ID8 part is where the classic brainstorming is going on, then leading into prototyping and testing. And I'm a great fan of design thinking. If you've not seen it, it's certainly worthwhile looking up. In the ID8 stage, our key goal here is to generate ways to solve the problem. And this is where we're going to entertain all sorts of wild options. And I love just sketching ideas. Now, you don't have to be Picasso or Michelangelo. In fact, sometimes the, the worse the pictures, the better. As long as you can understand what the picture is, it's a different way of getting your brain to interact. You may do a lot of wordsmithing in your day job, but trying sometimes to draw something rather than put words to it can give you new insights and new ways at looking at the problems. Now, if any of you have ever been like me and sometimes just got stuck, you're word blind, and you just can't think of any new ideas, well, here are the four R's for unblocking your thinking. And the first we called re-expression, re-expression. Could we take the, the, the exam question that we've been set and could we re-express it in the form of, say, tap dance, mime, poetry, maybe a song, maybe a rap, maybe a bit of artwork, maybe get some plasticine out. It may sound a little bit strange, but it then gives you different angles, different insights, and amazing how it then unlocks your sort of inner child and your creativity. The next are we call related worlds. Could you find a potential answer to your problem by stealing it? And innovation is all about steel with glee. The aviation industry for years have looked at birds' wings and tried to mimic nature. Eagles are superb flyers. So can we mimic in some way in commercial airlines? Great example of this is Nando's. I'm guessing a lot of you have either been or know of Nando's, the fast food sort of chicken restaurant. And they were looking some years ago to put their kitchen right in the middle of the restaurant to make it sort of open cooking so everybody can look in and see what the chefs are doing. They wanted to make it a different sort of experience, but also it then free up more tables to put more covers through to get more revenue. Now, you'd have thought that Nando's would go and look at some of their rivals, McDonald's, Wendy's, whatever, 
No, they went to talk to the American nuclear submarines. And you're probably thinking, Mike, what have nuclear submarines got to do with Nando's chicken? Well, on a nuclear submarine, I believe it's incredibly boring for many weeks on end when you're running on silent mode. And the highlight of the day for a submariner is their food. And they have Michelin qualified staff on their submarines, creating amazing food to keep the morale up. But you can imagine the size of the kitchens is tiny for obvious reasons. And by looking at Nando's, how could the chefs produce magic on a submarine? What could we steal to put into our restaurants? So could you find an answer in somebody else's world? Revolution is the next of the four R's. When you are stuck, just try breaking the rules because often we've limited ourselves by creating artificial rules. Classic case, think about pubs or bars. What are the rules of a pub or a bar? Well, the first one might be you've got to have a building. Well, do you have to have a building for a pub or a bar? The next rule, you've got to have glasses. Well, do you have to have glasses? The next rule, a magistrate's license to sell liquor. Well, you can't break that rule. It's the law. You'd be in prison. What about tables and chairs? Well, do you need tables and chairs? And a team came up with an idea for events like Ascot, Wimbledon, the FA Cup final, where perhaps it's a very short event, one or two days, and maybe difficult to put up a more rigorous structure. So they had a blow-up bouncy castle style of pub. Look tonight on eBay, about 30,000 quid, you can buy a blow-up bouncy castle pub blows up in half an hour. You then serve drinks from chiller units using battery power that come in pre-defined cans, gin and tonic, etc. So just break the rules that are perhaps inhibiting you, because many of them actually you can break, and it'll give you new insights, new fresh ideas. And the final one is what we call random links, perhaps the most creative of all, where you just take random images and you force your brain to form links between them. If the first random links don't work, throw them away, take other random links. So these four R's are a great way of when you get stuck in a brainstorm of unlocking your creativity. My next little um, technique is called imagination storming. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes, and you can do this in the main room and online. And I want you to think about mobile phones, that thing that you can't live without. And hence why I say close your eyes, don't look at it. But I'd like you to visualize what it does, what it looks like, what color it is. And then we're going to see what common threads come out from what you thought of. So close your eyes. And just for 30 seconds, try and visualize your phone, its touch, its color, what it does, how big it is, its texture, etc. Let's get thinking. So now you've thought of that, I'd like you to look through this list and which of these features in particular did you think about, did you visualize? And if you could just put one of those letters, A to H, in the chat, or if you're in the room, you could call out and Simon could put some in the chat. I was thinking on G. So G, so we've got quite a few A's. Got quite a few A's, got, got some B's. That, yeah, and the colour. Colour, it's really important. Colour, weight, camera. Each, so I think we've we, we probably got most, most A's. 
which is around size. So part two of the technique, what I want you to do now is to close your eyes again, and this time just concentrate on size and imagine new uses of that common feature that could make it better in the future. So how could we use size as a feature to improve mobile phones for the future? So again, just close your eyes, 30 seconds, think about that, and then we'll pop some of your answers into the chat. So close your eyes and think about size. Okay, so I want to pop back on to the chat. And what new uses could you think of that the size could be useful for in enhancing mobile phones? Love that Amit straight in, bigger photos and screen for typing. Simon, oh, project large image onto a wall. Work in view multiple tasks. Users, oh, identification, oh, I love that. Some ideas from the room? Oh, with the size, you can use it as a project tile. <laughs> <laughs> Hits people. <laughs> or to open a glass door. <laughs> As I see, see, Nigel's got fold down the middle, and of course, a lot of these things you're seeing in the tech that's coming out. So, very simple little technique there, where we're using the existing features to, as a kind of launch pad for ideas for future features. One of the most useful techniques that I've come across is we call greenhousing. I mentioned a little earlier problem that if we're not careful we all fall for is when we're doing brainstorming is oh no that won't work or oh, we tried that last time oh and i haven't got the money for that and very quickly we suck the energy like a dementor in harry potter out of people and it's human nature and i think somebody mentioned in the room earlier it's sort of not being critical too early in the process and the concept of greenhousing is very simple if you've got two little baby plants, you don't know which one will grow into the rose bush and which will be a bramble thorn until it had a chance to take seed and to start growing. So what does a gardener do? They put the little plants into a greenhouse, a glass house, to protect it from the rain and the snow and the wind and too much heat until they've had a chance to take seed and to, to grow a bit. Baby new ideas, embryonic ideas are very similar. Remember that quote about being a delicate flower. Now, what many plants need is sunshine. And sun here stands for suspend. So suspend judging. Try and understand where your colleague's coming from and try and nurture their idea. And what we're trying to avoid is too much rain. Now, admittedly, plants need a bit of water, but not a a tsunami of water and rain here stands for don't react in the moment oh that's rubbish don't assume that you're right and they're wrong or assume that they've got the wrong end of the stick and don't insist that your view your ideas are the best so lots of suspension of your views try and understand where other people are coming from nurture what they're doing and try and avoid too much rain. And some of that is down to perhaps the language that we use. Now, on the right hand side, you may have used some of these phrases yeah, but, no, but, we tried that before, it'll cost too much, management won't approve. I'm just as guilty as everybody else. But I try and use some of the language on the left hand side. Well, that's interesting, Simon, adding to, in addition to, building on that. What about? positive language to build up the little immature nascent idea rather than negative language that kills and squashes 
the ideas at birth. I do a lot of graduate onboarding. And of course, you'd hope that new joiners are fully enthusiastic, want to try out new things and ideas. If we're not careful, we can beat out of them their enthusiasm very quickly. So it's a subtle use of language, but has a huge impact on the outcome of your brainstorming. I also like to encourage playfulness. And there's something that I really like from John Cleese's research. He talks about trying to get into a childlike state, not childish. We don't do childish. That's for Simon's grandson. We don't do childish, but childlike where anything is possible. Now, I've been blessed with, with four children. The youngest is now 15, but and my youngest is only three or four. A brown box for her could be Rapunzel's castle, a tank, a train, a spaceship. But for me, being a 60-year-old dinosaur, all I could see is a brown box. I've lost my innate ability to see the world the way that a child does. And playfulness is about letting go, because if you think you know where you're going to end up when you brainstorm, well, you're lost at birth, because you'll end up with the same old answers you've had in the past. And again, going back to Simon and his grandson, you'll see when he's playing, children that play, it isn't totally random. They actually have an order and a process, albeit that us adults may not recognize it as such. And so we need to embrace the irreverent. And that's why sort of laughter and giggling is an essential part of creativity and brainstorming. Just consider days at work. I bet the best days at work has been a bit of fun, a bit of ribbing, a bit of giggling, a bit of larking about. And then things happen. When we have a solemn, sensible, grown-up day at work, I bet nothing new has come out of that kind of day. One of my favorite characters with my children was always Winnie the Pooh and Piglet. Useful concept we call piggybacking, piggybacking. And while we try and avoid too much critical thinking, we are allowed to build upon each other's contributions. And often, in fact, that's where good ideas come from. Do have a look. It's a fabulous author called Stephen Johnson, Stephen Johnson, who's done some great research as to where good ideas come from. And invariably, it's not, is it, was it um, Aristotle in his bath, Eureka, Eureka? Actually, it's where four or five or six people come together and they build on each other's ideas. They collaborate. I personally much prefer to be physically together, but in the post-COVID world, virtual collaboration is also important. So building upon, adding on other people's ideas is vital. As I mentioned earlier, laughter. It alters the brain chemistry, and it's where that childlike ability then comes from. My next general question back in the chat is, why are questions so important in brainstorming? Again, let me go quiet for 30 seconds. Yes, thank you. It was Archimedes, not Aristotle. Aristotle was a Monty Python character. So in the chat, why are questions so important in brainstorming? One of the things is that you get uh, feedback on the other point of views and also a little bit more yeah. of engagement. Questions can be the answers themselves. The more you question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the aristocratic method, right? Yeah. And of course, you ever watch uh, um, barristers at work because they never answer a question, but they you know answer it with another question. Uh, resets people's starting points, helping focus, sparking new ideas, thought processes, building on thoughts. Yes, definitely, definitely. And I've often found there's a number of different types of questions that you will want to use. Whether it's observational. Ooh. What do you notice about the product we're looking at? What jumps out at you on that web page? Introspective. And I think somebody in the, the room might have called out um, introspective questions, um, if I remember correctly. Introspective and retrospective questions. 
I've done a lot of work in Agile, you may have done as well. And of course, the idea in a sprint of having a retrospective every two or four weeks is invaluable for improving and learning. Lateral thinking, and I'll do a quiz on that a little bit later. Actionable questions. And of course, I think there's that famous, is it Voltaire quote about, judge a man by the quality of his questions rather than his answers. And of course, there's a, a new a, a new player that's come up called, well, say ChatGPT, but it's more than just ChatGPT, you know, the whole sort of um, Gen I, which I am loving. I might be 60, but I think I've learned more in the last six months using ChatGPT than I have in the previous 60 years put um, together. But I'm just popping into the chat a prompt that I've come up with that allows me to set up the chat GPT to be my personal brainstorming buddy. And you're very welcome um, to, um, to steal this um, as well. So in step one, I get it to set um, the stage for me, acknowledge the prompts and the topic we're going to engage in. So it's setting up that exam question. I'm, I'm, I'm just run through it. Um, the prompt sets up in um, six um, segments. The first is to basically set the stage and to set up the, the topic, i.e. the exam question. In the second stage, I get the AI to start using divergent thinking and just generate loads and loads of ideas, the way you would with um, real humans, pushing for quantity at this point. In step three, it then starts to build on the ideas. And a technique you may have come across is the yes and technique. Yes and how about adding to, building upon. Step four is then to start categorizing and organizing the ideas into themes and categories and patterns. Step five then starts to combine the ideas, synthesizing them into perhaps new solutions I haven't looked at before. And then six, I then do a prompt for different perspectives, looking for different angles, new angles on what's there. So, for instance, look at the answers from maybe the angle of being a marketer or an engineer or a doctor or a scientist or a military person to, again, see what that might um, throw up. And then finally, when I say sort of thank you, it concludes and then it pulls again a comprehensive list of all the ideas and patterns from that. And I've been using that for a month or so, and it's come up with some always two or three things that I would never have thought of, or at my age, I've just forgotten, which in itself can be very useful as well. So I think we're going to find that there is room for the um, AI. It's early doors. I'm not sure quite where it'll go, but certainly it'll be in there at some point. So tangential thinking. This is a random quick question. So in the chat, in this sequence, one, two, three, four, five, what should be under that question mark? What should be under the question mark? And you can call out from the audience or in the chat. So Rama's in there with a six. One, two, five. Kerry's in there with a six. Robert with an eight. Ooh, he's looking for the Fibonacci sequence. Barbara's in with 42. <laughs> Thank you, is, 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 is that the number of gins you've had? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> now, Simon knows that I'm a wicked old what's it. And, of course, it's nothing to do with numbers. Oh, and of course, tangential thinking. I think somebody mentioned earlier about you know, thinking outside of the box, upside, downside, inside, et cetera, et cetera. Again, could you get the Gen I to perhaps do a bit of tangential thinking for you as well? So as we coming up towards the close, let me share with you some hot tips that you could take away. And I think a couple of these may be mentioned early on. Brainstorming is perhaps your, your classic thing you're doing during that ideation stage but you might come across brain writing where each person writes down ideas and then you pass the piece of paper you know the person to your left and you, you carry on adding to 
what people in front of you in the queue have done. Brain walking. Now, here's an interesting little bit of science. Sitting and talking and walking and talking have different impacts on the brain. If you've ever got a difficult conversation to have with somebody, it's often easier to go for a walk, maybe outside in the park, than sit, perhaps staring at each other across a table. And I know this from doing performance reviews, especially if it's people aren't working, performing very well. Make you smile. This may be one to um, edit out, Simon, but I was doing this lecture a couple of years ago, and one young lady said, oh, Mike, she said, you're dead right. Over the weekend, I had to dump a boyfriend, and we were sat in Costa Coffee, and I just couldn't do it over the coffee. We went for a walk in the park. It's history now. So potentially walking could also be another way, again, it gets the brain to work differently. And brain dumping, where you just, as it says, dumping everything down. So there are some other types of, of brain activities that you might want to use. The De Bono thinking hats, um, Edward De Bono, probably kind of the godfather of creativity. I'm not sure if he's still with us, bless him. I did meet him in the flesh about 20 years ago. Fascinating chap. But his thinking hats, and what I particularly like about these is to, if you're struggling to get out of that, or oh, let's go straight into critical mode, you can say, okay, we're going to do some green hatting now. So no criticism. It's just getting lots of ideas out. And then if you're getting a little bit stuck, well, let's go to red hat. And let's just do it purely on your gut, your emotional pieces. So it's a useful way of controlling the flow if necessary. And then, of course, at some point, you do need to have some critical piece when the black hat comes on. Because at some point, you need to take away some of the ideas and work them into possible solutions. I showed you a picture a little earlier of a real life using whiteboards. Because of COVID, I've been getting to use a lot of the online whiteboards. You've got things like Miro and Mural, which are great tools. But in fact, the, the MS whiteboard that tends to come as a freebie with your Microsoft license, they've really upped their game. A couple of years ago, it, it was rubbish in my mind, but it's really upped its game. There's loads of templates in there, and there's some new features like um, Follow Me. So if you've got a lot of people, they can see what it is that you're doing on screen. So I'm not on commission, by the way, with Microsoft, but it's just one that you may well have immediate access to. Similarly, I've been using the mind maps that you get in tools like Visio. Um, I'm fortunate I've got a Visio license. If you do, do go and have a look in here. Because again, they put loads and loads of diagrams and things, and I find mind mapping particularly useful. It's half past seven. How observant are you? Quick question, in which direction is this car going? Left or right? So either type it in the chat or shout out from the main room. Is it going left or right? Not right. drifting. It's not going anywhere. Ah, spot on. Who said it's not going anywhere? We have some. Yeah. Take about. It's not it got, got got any tires. And again, that sort of mean mic. And you, you want your brain to be able to start to see the non oh, invisible tires. Invisible tires, yes. In fact, just yesterday, I went to our staff Christmas party, and it was a fancy dress party. So I actually stayed at home and told them I was going as the invisible man. <laughs> now, of course, some of you will be annoyed at me for tricking you up. So that's twice now, once with the gear lever and once with the tires. So now's your chance to redeem yourself. And this is a, a car park in Hong Kong, which number car parking spot is that car hiding so we've got what 1606 68 88 and 98 what number is it hiding 87. and well done if you've seen that one before yep it's 87 now when they did this a few years ago in hong kong the five-year-old school children got it immediately the adults couldn't get it at all because of course we're adults, we're grown-ups, we're clever, we're looking for unusual sequences. The children saw it immediately. 
because of that childlike state. And one of my favorite techniques, scamper, scamper, it just reminds me of different things that I can use around my brainstorming. And it stands for substitute. So could I substitute one thing for another? Going back to that phone, could I substitute color, cameras? Could I combine two things together? And in fact, you could argue that the iPhone, it isn't actually innovative or new. They've just combined a phone, a camera, an MP4 player, a range of other bits, and then they've conned you into spending $1,000 to buy a new one every 18 months. Mm -hmm. Could we adapt things that are already there? Could we modify or magnify, make bigger, make smaller? Could we put to another use? And that was part of my little thing earlier about could the size be put to a different use? Could you take something out? I don't know if it's a true story or not, but apparently when the first sort of iPhone, they came to Steve Jobs and he said, have you scrunched it? Have you condensed it as much as you can? Yes, Steve, we have. And he said, I don't believe you. And the story goes, he had a big fish tank in his office and he went and dropped the prototype iPhone into the fish tank and bubbles of air came out. There, he said, there's still room. Go away, make it smaller. And of course, is it 100 billion they've got in the bank now? Or could you reverse its use? So none of these in their own light are sort of clever rocket science. But a lot of innovation and creativity is just small 1% increases. It's not a sudden rocket to the moon, etc. So Scamper is a great one for that. Here's a couple of tips for facilitating brainstorms. I'd hope most of these are obvious um, to you. Number three in the, the do bit, do treat silly ideas the same as serious ones. And Simon knows me as being the most silly person he's ever met. But sometimes it is the silliest idea that actually wins the day. And there's a story about Alaska, where it's winter for 13 months of the year in Alaska. And what you may not know is that they actually generate a lot of electricity that's then taken on big electrical you know, cables and pylons down the, the western seaboard through Canada, Seattle, all the way down to San Francisco, Los Angeles. And you can imagine in winter that huge icicles form on the electrical cables and the weight of the icicles can bring the cables crashing down. Now, I think Alaska, is it something like 42 times the size of Britain? Or it's just enormous. And the cost to get engineers out to fix the cables, it runs into millions of dollars, notwithstanding then not meeting your service level agreements. So a team of engineers were doing a brainstorm of, well, how can we you know, fix this problem? And one of the young engineers straight out of grad school put his hand up and said, oh, I know what we need to do. I've seen a David Attenborough show which shows that brown bears like to scratch their backs on trees, get rid of the itches and get rid of parasites and nits and things. Why don't we persuade the brown bears to scratch their backs on the pylons, pylon poles? That make the poles vibrate slightly. That in turn will make the cables vibrate and that will bring the icicles down when they're just small icicles before they become too big. Now, the big chief engineer was about to say, stupid boy, Pike, get back in your box. He thought, oh, no, 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 greenhousing, greenhousing. No, no, no buts. Yes, and, yes, and. He said, you know what? We don't have any brown bears. But what we do have, though, is Chinook helicopters. You know, the ones with the big double rotary blades. And as you may know, up in the ice flows of Canada, there's loads of oil and gas. And every day, men and materials going up and down in great big Chinook helicopters. And the chief engineer said, why don't we get the helicopters to fly a bit to the left, a bit to the right, and follow the lines of the pylons that say 50 feet above? The downforce from the two turboprops on the helicopter blades will have that same rippling effect and clear the icicles. Extra cost, well, zero, because they're doing the trips anyway. Savings, tens of millions of dollars a year. 
So what started as the world's most stupid idea of getting brown bears to scratch their asses against cables, just one step to the right turned into one of the most fabulous ideas. So the next time somebody says to you, that's a stupid idea, just say, Mike told me brown bear. A couple of tips if you're doing virtual brainstorms. The important one for me is plan to do 20% less than you would in a physical workshop. Um, today, I'm not a Zoom expert and I've got a few things wrong and therefore I run out of time a little bit. Plan to do a little bit less. One advantage you've got, and I say apologies to those in the room, is the chat feature, which you don't have in the physical, unless you're perhaps using phones or iPads and something like that, like a Slido or a um, quiz or, or a um, car hoots. So do make use of those. Another useful tip is the furthest first technique. So we've got, what about, oh, is it about a dozen, 15 people in the main room, and we've got about 30 people on the video links, on the phone links. When you're doing perhaps a round robin to get everybody to reply, put their ideas in, go to the person who's furthest away geographically from the main room. So if someone's dining in from, say, Edinburgh, go to them first, then the guy in Liverpool, then the guy in Manchester, the guy in Leeds, the guy in Birmingham, and so on, to make sure that you don't always just centre on the 15 in the main room. Not just brainstorming, but any virtual meeting, that would work well for you. And the final tip or trick is using word clouds which most of the polling tools use. But instead of actually using words, use emote icons, because most of the systems allow those. And it's just a little bit different. And often an emote icon can perhaps give more, quotes, emotion than just words alone. So I think we're at 9.38, and I think, was it 9.30, sorry, 19.38, was it 1936? Simon, that we were meant to be landing for the, the wrap-up piece? Well, we said that uh, we would expect people to become a little bit more interactive and vocal and raise their own thoughts and ideas um, from vaguely 7.36, I think it was. So uh, we, do have, um, we do have another 20 minutes if people want to take you in any particular directions, Mike. I mean, that's fine. And I'm very happy to have either one question, no questions, or a thousand questions. But, um, if you're online and want to make a contribution, it doesn't have to be a question. It can be an observation or an idea, something smart, something that might come in your own brainstorming. Um, please feel free to turn on your mic and talk to us. Um, if you can, you turn on your video as well. People in the room, likewise, please uh, feel free to um, offer some fresh thoughts and um, challenge Mike on anything that you feel should be challenged on. Mike, there was a strong visual theme throughout what you presented, and that, yes. that's fantastic. But sometimes you can get really good ideas from people who are visually impaired or hearing impaired yep. or introverts or autistic. So are there things that can be done to encourage inclusivity of, of that kind of diversity in the brainstorming process? Well, you noted that I got you a couple of times actually to close your eyes for that very reason. And I could argue that sometimes the doing it you know, through, the, through, through the virtual um, piece, my assumption is that somebody who was visually impaired would have some kind of sort of screen reader and the ability to convert voice to text so that they could add their thoughts into the um, chat so it would get picked up that way um, as well. Probably more difficult in the hybrid environment. I'm thinking if I had a, um, people who had things like sort of um, sight difficulties, so maybe everybody goes on to the virtual, again, perhaps um, level the um, uh, playing field. I'm not a huge Strictly Come Dancing fan, but I think, was it the last season, there was a deaf actress that took part. And in one of her dances, they turned the music off for about 30 seconds. So everybody experienced what she did every Saturday evening 
of having to dance, not being able to hear the music. So I think it'd be great if there was if you could do that to make sure that everybody that experiences what's going on. Thank but you. A good call. Good call. Actually, to add to that, I mentioned about having sort of creativity boxes where we had things like sort of play doh, slinkies, so actually and texture. Whether that could be included, I've not tried that myself. But that's certainly an interesting one to do. How can we balance quantity and quality during the brainstorm process? One way I've seen is sort of divergent and then sort of out. Is it, is it convergent? So you might go through two or three sort of round robins. I've done sometimes where you sort of start with just brainstorming a whole lot down and then maybe look for some themes and perhaps we're going to do the next sort of 90 minutes on this theme, stop, have a pause, then take another theme and go in that direction. The harvesting part is, to me, some of the most difficult bits because who's going to do that harvesting? That's maybe where I go back to my sort of key sponsor and stakeholders that perhaps we're you know, trying to tackle things with and get them to get involved. Another tip with things like sort of stakeholders is I may get them to come in just to set the scene in the exam question and then push them out the room. But sometimes having them in the room can stifle creativity. I notice, especially with Japanese clients and military stroke police, where have very hierarchical ways of working. If you've got one person in the room who's slightly more senior than the other 20, they all defer to that one person. In which case, try and put them to one side and get them to come back just towards the end. Um, another trick in the virtual world, when you get that awkward silence and nobody's answering, what I do is say in the chat, either write your question you've got or give me, say, a smiley face to indicate that you've got no questions. So they've got a binary thing. They must do either X or Y. Doing nothing isn't an option. If any of you have got children or got your nephews and nieces, you must never give the child a choice where one of the choices is no. Do you want to wear your red coat or your blue coat? Not do you want to wear your coat, because the answer will be no. So similarly, don't give your audience None has been one of the options. Give them a binary choice. How do you ensure everybody's had a voice, especially where there are bosses and their reports are in the room? Well, Virginia, part of that, as I said, is perhaps send the boss out so that they don't inhibit what's being said. I know bosses who are very good about making sure they go last in the round robin. Often they may start with perhaps the, perhaps the most junior person, because that most junior person may actually have the most interesting creative ideas. An old dinosaur like me that's been around for so long, all I can see is a hammer as being the solution to every problem. You may find by the time you've gone round, the boss has nothing new to add because all the good stuff has already been said. Can focusing on the current business problems stifle transformative solutions? Potentially, and that's where sort of related worlds I find is useful. I was on a five-day creativity course, gosh, many, many years ago. And they actually sent us out. We had a challenge of coming up with new sort of hair washing products. So we went out onto the street and we, we just stopped random people. Eventually they called the police on us, but just asking, for instance, mums of prams, well, how do you go about cleaning babies? We then asked sort of old ladies with blue rinses, well, what do you do? We then went to talk to a hairdresser. Well, that's an obvious one. We then went to talk to a dog grooming parlor to see what sort of insights might have. And finally, we went to a mortician to see what is it they do with you know, deceased people. Again, to see if there are any insights we could get. So looking outside of our normal worlds gave us some fascinating insights. Think back to your early brainstorm sessions. How do you conduct them? What's changed and what stayed the same? I think for me, what's changed, I've learned more about the use of sort of humor and different sort of props to get into that childlike state. When I first started, um, I was working with one of the big um, American consultancies, and there's a very much a definitive house style. And being 23, I just follow the house style. 
now I've seen lots of other ways of doing things. I've sort of stolen the best of other people's ways of doing things. Mike, Barbara Bob, has her yeah. uh, hand up. Yep, yeah, Barbara. Hello, Barbara. Hi, Mike. How are you? Very well, very well. I've, I've known Barbara for a couple of years, so good to see you, Barbara. 300 at least. <laughs> One of my, my question, because I don't think it came up, and it was a technique I sometimes use successfully in face-to-face, -face, was asking people to write down all the negative stuff and then saying, we can't, um, I literally once put it in a suitcase and took it outside the door. And I wondered, and it was very effective because it was a naughty problem that people needed to absolutely not go back to what was. And you know how sometimes you can get really hung up in yeah. the negative conversation about what's wrong. And I wondered if you've ever tried that online, because it strikes me with the chat and everything, it's quite hard to put things down and then say, right, I'm going to delete. All. <laughs> well, I suppose you could delete. Yeah. Anyhow, what do you think what of you that? Could? And well, how yes. would you manage it? Well, um, it's a technique I call the wall of whinge or the negative right. wall. Yeah. And classically done, um, and it, it partly answers one of the early questions about when you've got lots of the right ideas, how do you go forward? So you say, right, we've done all this, right, let's have a, a win session. Let's come up with all the reasons why it will not work. Because humans were brilliant at why it won't work. Look at political parties, but not so good at how it will work. And classically, in the old days, I get lots of big post-it notes and physically make a wall. It looks like bricks. Mm -hmm. And I'm of a certain age where I have the original Pink Floyd, the wall, on vinyl. Then you say, right, that's the, the wall. How do we conquer? How do we get rid of these? Okay, let's take the first item. Well, if this is the problem, what's the, the solution? What's the workaround? And it could be actually one idea might knock out two or three. Some, it might be a one-to-one -one relationship. And as you work your way through, knocking away at the wall, a bit like Pink Floyd did, you're coming up with an action list. Because mm. here are the five, 20 things you need to do to get past all the whinges. And then you can you know, prioritize it and, and, and so on. But getting everything off the chest is always a good way. Because then you can see who's got particular problems. And when you're doing your planning, doing your projects, et cetera, you, you could argue it's part of your stakeholder analysis um, as well. So, yes, the, the wall of whinge is a very, very handy technique. Somebody over there was trying to speak when, we, when Barbara came on. I was, I was just raising the, the point that Barbara was... Uh... And I can see that um, um, Desmond put something about add a tool to share ideas on a no-name basis, and then getting people to rate each other anonymously. Yes, sort of, um, I'm sort of silent voting, secret voting. One that I like doing is you can get heart-shaped post-it notes, often sort of pink. And what I would do is maybe you've got 20, 30, 40 sort of ideas. Everybody gets, say, three or four votes, three or four hearts. So you vote with your heart, with your passion. There we go. <laughs> Barbara's got them on cue. And then you either do it, everybody, at the same time. Because there's a slight worry there about you. Are you looking out the corner and say, where's your boss voting? And then does that sway you? In which case, you might have to everyone come in the room independently. Um, and you can do this um, electronically. You normally hope people by then that what goes to Vegas stays in Vegas rules and you aren't being swayed. And the people then go and vote passionately. Now, say you've got four votes. You could put all four on one particular item if you're so passionate about that. Or you might do two and two or one, one, one. The choice is yours. It's your vote. It's very, 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 um, you know, um, a democratic way of doing things. So... That no name basis can certainly go through. I would hope that my groups are, you know, trust each other such that you can put names up, but you can certainly do it by no names as well. And Virginia is saying you sort of brief people in advance so they come with some ideas and, and avoid being cold. It goes back to that John Cleese piece around having enough time before you arrive to get into the right state of mind. I'm guessing any of you that are into sport, you wouldn't dream of going for a run without properly warming up your body. Similarly, your brain needs to be warmed up. And part of that is where Icebreakers Energizers comes in. But I think our continual 
It's called barcoding. If you ever look at your calendar, 10 minute, five minute, 10 minute, it looks like a barcode on a packet of crisps. If you've got things like Viva Insights, you can put on focus times. And I would always put a half hour focus time before a brainstorm. So I can both get my body and my brain ready. Arriving at 30 seconds, arriving 30 seconds late, I just won't be in the right frame of mind to do a good brainstorm. Uh, do you have any take on metrics uh, before the brainstorm? What would be the good measurements or metrics for the things that will be considered during the brainstorm? I suppose the, you could look at the, 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 the quantity, but quantity doesn't always equate to quality. I think probably I'd be asking my stakeholder up front, what would, you know, two or three good, you know, what good look for you? Two or three, you know, key performance indicators. Would it be that we've got a final solution? We've got two or three prototypes. And that's, I suppose, you look at um, design thinking, it is all around iteration and prototyping. Um, Dyson, I don't anyone's got one of those Dyson vacuums. I think he went through 526 iterations before he got his first one out. Um, Edison said he found a thousand ways how to not make a light bulb before he finally did make a light bulb. So you could argue, actually, almost the more iterations. It comes to a point, of course, where you've got to go to market, otherwise somebody's beating you to it. I can see um, 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 Kerry Green saying, depends on the individuals. She used to have a stakeholder who was very reflective and struggled as she was cold. I do a lot of work, um, especially in the learning side of things. And there's a number of theories, but Kolb's learning theory has four main sort of learning styles. The first we call the activist, the activist, the one that's always got the hand up, always at the whiteboard, always doing things. Then you've got the reflector. I think Kerry perhaps is referring to, who likes to just to think, cogitate, digest, have another thought before putting the hand up. You then got what we call the, the theorist. They want a theory, a model they can hang things off. And then finally, there's the pragmatist. Yeah, Mike, that's great the last hour, but next Monday with my client, how do I actually make this work? Give me some real life case examples of that. Of course, we're actually, we're all a mix of all four, but we'll have our natural references. And good sort of learning design appeals to all four styles. So that's why classically you might start with a bit of a lecture and a model. And then you have some, let me tell you a time when I was at the Bank of England, United Nations, and it all worked, all went badly. And then you have that reflection time, and often you have an activity so all four of the different learning styles. And similarly, you want to design your brainstorming for, again, the different types of people you'll have in your room. And at each time, one or other people in the room, it'll, it'll reflect, it'll activate, it'll be theory, it'll be pragmatist, it'll hit them. I'm seeing there's any more questions. I think we've gone through most of those. Any additional questions in the room? I was just thinking, Mike, that you reminded me there of um, an archetypal consultancy partner <laughs> in the consulting firm and the, with their approach, because they go, well, maybe they use different technology these days, but they would have gone straight to the flip chart and they'd have painted five stripes, no, four, no, maybe three stripes on it. And they'd say, we do this, then we do that, then we do that. Yeah. A par partner's project plan. <laughs> it takes a few um, seconds. I'm, I'm, I never made it to partner, and I don't know if that's because I can't do straight lines or because I use a creative approach. I shall leave the audience to decide on that. I, I, I think everybody will have found that absolutely wonderful uh, exploration of the subject matter. Um, I, I enjoyed that a lot. And Mike is always a great edutainer, as he was saying earlier on. And uh, I think uh, it was a fabulous session to have at our, our last uh, event before the um, down season of um, year end. So that's fantastic. Can I, everybody um, show their appreciation in the traditional way?
for that. Super, many thanks, and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. It's always good fun to come along. I shall leave you with a Christmas joke in the chat. And wish you bon voyage, Avida Zane. Have a fantastic new year and get creative. It's a lot of fun and find your inner child. Cheerio for now, everybody. Thanks, Simon. Bye. Thanks, Barbara. Do say hi to little Peter. Have a wonderful Christmas, everybody. Cheerio. Bye. -bye.